Hey TCS TV viewers, it's Dave from the Camera Store and today we're out in the prairies photographing some abandoned buildings. Today we have a very special episode and a very special guest. His name is Robert Scott and he's a local commercial and landscape photographer and he has a great series going on with abandoned houses and the tours he brings people on. So Rob, thanks for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about what's going on. Thanks Dave. Uh, yeah, I'm a, a commercial and landscape photographer. I, I run a small company called Abandoned Photo Tours uh, and I take people around the prairies of Alberta and Saskatchewan and uh, we visit these places uh, with permission from the from the farmers or the landowners and we are free to roam, take pictures and be creative. So you are well known for your like night photography of these buildings. So we're gonna do a little of that later on today, but throughout the day, we're gonna have a bunch of different tips and techniques and how you like to compose things and how you wanna make it work. So I'm looking forward to getting into this and checking out these different locations. All right, so this is our first location, Rob. Now, how did you even find this place? I mean, this is the middle of nowhere. I thought I drove most of the roads in southern Alberta, but I've never been here myself. Uh, this place I found, oh boy, it was years ago, and it was just uh, meandering at the time, just scouting out back, back road locations, and then I was like, oh, look at this place. But you know, like, a ton about this place already. How did you find that out? Well, over the years, it's been really important to get uh, permission for these places. So you track down the landowners and ask for permission and then they actually give me a lot of the information. They say, well, this place was owned by James Ferguson back in the, in the 30s. So then uh, from there, he would just go ahead and tell me the whole story about James Ferguson. Well, when you first show up to a scene like this, do you sort of have an idea in, in mind what you want or what you have? Uh, well, when I first come onto the scene, I, I just take a look with my eyes and go, hey, that's cool. With the, with the bigger picture, if I see like the whole landscape, if you will, I see the sky and then I marry it to the subject, which is the house. So in this instance right here, you've got this incredible pattern of, of clouds and it, it fits along nicely with the shape of the, the house there. And if you have a polarizer on, it's really gonna pop out those blues. That's it. Okay. Now when you're framing, do you kind of like look at like the rule of thirds? Do you break those rules a lot? Do you have sort of a set guidelines that you kind of look or you just kind of go with what looks good? Yeah, yeah. Like I know of the rule of thirds, but I never go through, oh, like this is, I better put this here and put that there. I just basically, uh, you know, go with experience and say, hey, you know what? It looks good over in this bottom right hand corner. I have to make sure that I'm not uh, cutting any of the trees out or anything's like poking into the side of my, my frame give the shot, and then I just review it on the back of the LCD screen. Sometimes I'll go a little bit wider, and then if I have to crop in later on to get a, a tighter shot, then I will. Well, like you, I'm trying to be cool. I'm shooting the R5 as well, but you have the 2470 on there. I brought along the new 14 to 35, so it's a little wider. Do you find 24 is wide enough for most of the stuff that you shoot? I do, but you know, I, th I think the, the biggest thing that I find with people is that they, they're, I don't want to say, do I say gear p yeah, I shoot a lot with my 24 to 70. I find that if I want to go super wide, it, it can be very niche. And I find that if people, a lot of people waste a lot of time uh, changing in between lenses. So if I really stick to one lens, if I'm doing like, like an abandoned photo tour or for it's high noon, then I find that I get more images out of the day and different compositions than I were if I were to keep on switching out lenses. So you like using a zoom better than a prime lens? Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Honestly, I'm not, like, a lot of people seem to think that, oh, you have to have prime lens because we're going to be the sharpest. Most of the images that people post anyways is going to be on social media, so it's not going to be, you know, you're, people just kind of, that's just my opinion. Yeah. People are kind of being... No, in this generation, the lenses are fantastic, so yeah. uh, either way. So, yeah, let's get a little bit closer to here. I want to explore this building. You said there's, like, a stove is still in here? There's a stove in here. Uh, James Ferguson was known for his shortbread cakes during uh, Christmas time. <laughs> 
Now, do you use different apps or do you use different, uh, like what, what high tech stuff do you use to help work buildings and work your style of photography, like finding places? Well, there's photo pills, yeah. but I, I don't really use it that much. I just, I just show up and whatever nature gives me, I shoot it. It's kind of a surprise, but uh, I don't ever let myself down if I plan a whole thing out and you know, the Milky Way doesn't come out or the, the moon is hidden or something like that. So yeah, I'm not a big techie. I'll just, I'll shoot what I see. So typically when I come onto some, some sites, I'll always give the foregrounds a good look, a good look over. So what I like to do is I like to frame the subject. So what I can do is I can take these two bushes and then frame the house right in between. And you can use like a low aperture of like 2.8 so you can blur out your, your foreground. And then what I'll do is I'll actually shoot at a uh, small aperture too. Like I'll go F16. So if I don't like the way the F2.8 looks, F16 looks pretty good. Actually, I prefer that. So here, I'll go first. So I should tell you that when I first walk into these places, here, hold on my camera, okay. I'll go like, I'll give it a clap or I'll go, hey, and I'll just make myself known. So if there's any, if there's any pigeons or birds up there. Or, or evil spirits. Or evil spirits, exactly, <laughs> evil spirits. Okay, and then I'll probably just give the house a little bit of a bang. If it doesn't fall down. Peek in, yep, step through. <laughs> Safety tips. A uh, good pair of boots, so you're not going to step on any nails. I've been pretty lucky. If you're going alone, make sure someone knows where you are. Get permission. That's the big one is get permission because the, the farmer will tell you where the wells are on the property because some of these wells are quite dangerous and you can fall into them. Um, fourth one is dress appropriately. So good pants, dress for the weather. Uh, be mindful of where you step because there is just stuff everywhere. Uh, make loud noises for wildlife. If there is no pigeon activity in the house, that could be a good example of uh, an owl nesting. So uh, if there's pigeons, there's usually no owls. Uh, smell for skunks. If you step on stairs, step on the front lip of the tread. Because you don't want to step in here because that's where it'll break. Step right here, and you want to stay close to the edges of the of the stringers on the side. Not that I'm promoting people to go into these places and walk up, like the it's rotted right there. So like even this, like you like if if I see where all, all these nails are, you know that's, that's you can bet that's probably a good place to, to stand because that's where one of the joists are. But if you start getting over to like something like this, like look. Yeah, like that's, and you'll go right through. So what I've got here is uh, not a lot of interest in the foreground here. So I'm going to put the, the house in the bottom right hand corner. But what's really interesting is that that blade of uh, cloud coming up the peak. So I'm going to do one shot for the, the house. And then I'll do one shot for the sky. Roughly about there. And then afterwards I can do an exposure blend and I can blend those two images together. Like what I used to do is I used to go take three, four, five to seven bracketed shots and then you would, you know, you know, HDR them up. I don't do that so much anymore. I can come out here, take one shot and with the, the R5, the dynamic, dynamic ranges is so awesome that you can pull down that, the highlights and increase the shadows and, and doesn't introduce a lot of noise or artifacting. So yeah, the R5 has definitely been a, a game changer. Uh, another thing that I like to do is get my composition and, and move on. What I find too often is somebody will sit in the same spot and just take the same shot over and over and over again as if it's going to magically become better. Trust yourself, get your shot, move on so you go back with a whole bunch of different compositions rather than 50 of the same one.
Here's another tip I'll show you. What, I, what I'll do is I'll line up my composition. I know there's pigeons there right now. So for the first shot, I will just do an exposure for the house. I'll check my histogram. That looks pretty good. So I'll do one shot for the house. Okay, then I'll take it off a two second timer and I'll go back to just doing single shots. And then I'm going to take down my exposure. So I just get the silhouette, probably something like that. Fly this way. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> oh, there they go. Okay, now hopefully they come back. Come on up here. There's another. There we go. All right, Robert, we are finally where I want to be. We've had some, a great day exploring some of those houses you showed us earlier, and it's been fantastic. But at nighttime is where you kind of have a signature look, I notice. You go to these abandoned buildings and shoot them by night. We're fortunate tonight we have a full moon, which has given us amazing light. But you also illuminate houses a little bit as well. Now, is this part of your abandoned house tour? Yeah, so when, yeah, when we go on tours, the, the idea is uh, a lot of people are inexperienced with night photography. So what I try to do is try to get uh, everybody get one shot in camera without doing any exposure blending or luminosity masks or anything. So that's, that's the goal. And I've got a couple techniques that I do that, that, that uh, render that, that awesome look. That's pretty cool. I mean, during the day, technically, it's one side of things. And you're not the biggest technical photographer, right? You just don't like to, you know, to, to dive into it super deep, right? Thanks, Dave. I know, I know, right? Yeah, but, you know, yeah. 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 But finally, we're out here. We're shooting with a tripod, because you don't, you don't use a tripod during the day for the most part. Yeah. But this is much more of a technical shoot. This yeah. is where you have to sort of know your stuff a little bit more to get the results you want. Yeah. Are there any, like, like big tips and, and techniques that you sort of come to mind when you first say, hey, let's go shoot a house at night? Well, solid tripod. Pod, you have to have a good set of legs. Um, you have to make sure you, that your image stabilizer is turned off of your, your lens because you don't want to have your lens constantly searching for a focal point. Composition is key. And then afterwards, strategically placing the lights and then taking multiple shots after the sun sets to when it's completely dark. So you can actually pull different exposures from different places and then maybe do a composite afterwards too. But ideally the night shot is we get it at one shot. One shot. No, I like that yeah. too, as I'm not a huge fan of post-processing stuff. I'd rather yeah. be outside here freezing. Yeah, yeah. and so like, <laughs> like even with the full moon, the full moon is awesome because it's, it's pretty much lit. We can just take it in one shot and we're golden. We can go home. Um, when, I, when, the, when the moon is not around, what I technically have is I have a, a drone, a Mavic 2 Pro, and it's got a really powerful LED. I throw it up and it just bays the whole area in light, even on those dark nights. And then you can get the really, really, like the, the bright Milky Way and uh, foreground all in one shot. So we're gonna go into the house and we're gonna strategically place this uh, loom cube panel into one of the top bedrooms up there to uh, give the feel as if someone is lit their oil lantern just before they, they've gone to bed. So this one, this uh, uh, the panel is really cool because you can set the, the Calvin. So I'll set it to like a really, really warm temperature. And then afterwards I can really kind of play with the hues to make it look as if it's like lantern orange. So let's go. So the hard thing about night photography is trying to uh, strategically place the light. So most people make the mistake of trying to shine a light out the window, where in fact you need to illuminate the room to get the glow as if someone's home. So what I do is I'll try to find a spot against the wall or a back corner. And then this already has a diffuser on it and it's already at its warmest temperature. So I'll just go ahead and aim it towards this back corner and that should be it. Bobby, where do you start if somebody comes out here, doesn't know anything about photography, night photography, where do you kind of start as a base setting or to kind of get a baseline for them? All right, well, what we do is we usually start them off when there's still light out. So we'll start them off at F8, ISO 100, and then we dial in whatever shutter speed it is at the time. So what we want to do is we want to um, expose for the ambient light, which would primarily be the sky. So after we do that, once it starts to get darker and darker, then we start to increase the shutter speed, and then we start to decrease the, or sorry, open up the aperture, and then lastly, we start to open up the ISOs as, as well. So that way um, amateurs or, or people who don't know what they're doing at the night can, can slowly and incrementally see how your exposure works when the light starts to, to dissipate.
All right, so we are inside the spooky, scary house, and if something jumps out at me, I am gonna freak out. I just know it. Now, Bobby, I wanna thank you for coming out with us tonight. This has been fantastic, the whole day, actually, and getting to know, I really appreciate that you are getting to know the people and the stories behind these old buildings. I mean, we often drive by them, and you're like, well, that's an old building, right? But we don't know the history behind it, so it's really nice to get that sort of level of attachment. Yeah, yeah it's funny when people say if these walls could talk, that comment drives me nuts. The, uh, the abandoned photo tours, uh, which is what I do, was started about a couple of years ago because we want to bring safety and permission from the farmers all in, in one shot. Plus, you can, can learn more about night photography as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a well-wrapped up course that, uh, um, you know, everyone comes out with something. So the, the farmers, they get our permission or we get their permission from them and then... Uh, people come out learning some night photography skills. Yeah, now are we talking like 50, 60 people in a course? Or no, what? no, they're, they're, no, they're, they're minimal. Uh, they're anywhere from like six people up to eight people because we don't like to stack tripods next to tripods and, and it's more of an experience that I'm trying to bring people. So it's, uh, it, they're, they're quite popular and we go all over Alberta and Saskatchewan and you know, who knows, maybe someday we'll break into like France or Germany, <laughs> or lots of abandonment over there. So. Yeah, no, I mean, it's been great. I mean, I definitely feel a, a, a better sense of history here. And I mean, you and I are both raised on the prairies, right? We both yeah. know that there's so much out there and these buildings aren't gonna last forever. So I appreciate that. Now you have a, a bunch of other stuff on the go too, right? You've got yeah. some books coming out and you also have a documentary series. Yeah, it's a documentary it's called Secondary Highway. Uh, right now we've wrapped up the first season now we just have to do the editing, but uh, it's basically a 10 part, uh, 10 part documentary on uh, iconic houses in and around Alberta. And uh, uh, the way we got started with it was talking to these farmers to get permission to go on to do these tours. And uh, they've been willing to tell us the, the stories and the stories have been either heartbreaking or funny or exciting, but uh, you know, like the millennials nowadays, they don't know what it was like, you know, walking both <laughs> up, up, up to school, up both ways barefoot you know the story so yeah so they they tell us those stories and uh, you know all the the history of their 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 families where they're buried now it's pretty crazy yeah I mean we, we, we toured the uh, the cemetery there earlier and it's really kind of cool to see that kind of history and it's just this wide open prairie and we always drive by these houses and we always wonder you know what are these all about so I hope you guys enjoyed this content today if you want to see more content like that leave comments down below make sure you follow us both on Instagram and please subscribe and hit that notification bell we'll catch you again next time Robert Scott Cold weather tips. Yeah. Suck it up. No, this is, it's got hair on it, so I think this is probably a like a looks like a coyote. Yeah, it's big. It's fairly big. So there is this one house. I was actually I had my legs straddled through here, and I'm shooting at the window, and there's this massive porcupine <laughs> came right up out underneath me. So I bolted that way, and he bolted that way, and we both screamed. So <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Hey, thanks for sticking around for this episode. And if you want to check out our more recent episodes, click up here. And if you're a Canadian, you want to shop local, check out thecanvasstore.com down here.